Bruce Marriage Office here at Franciscan University of Steubenville, and I am not alone. I have a very special guest tonight, Mr. Chris Stefanik. Chris, say hello to everybody. How's it going? Thanks for having me on, John. Chris, we're, we're excited that you're here. Uh, you, know, I, um, you know, our topic tonight is about rebuilding the church and the mission of our conference office and, and where that comes from and how we live that out, not just through our conference outreach, but how all of us live that out. And I really appreciate Chris because Chris really is somebody I've seen uh, for many years now in, in service of the church, building the church, and, and uh, he goes, he's had a lot of job descriptions, a lot of titles in ministry, but I think the thing I appreciate most about uh, Chris is that he's just a brother in Christ. And it's always great when you share the work of the Lord with a brother in Christ like Chris. So uh, um, he's, he brings a ton of experience just in, on different levels, from the parish to the diocese, and now with his national ministry, which I'm hoping he'll share a little bit about later on in, in the, uh, the webinar. So welcome, Chris. We're glad you're here. And for all of you out there in webinar land, thank you for joining us uh, tonight here uh, on this broadcast. Uh, it is an exciting topic. You know, we look around the church right now and we see areas uh, where faith has grown cold and, and hearts have grown cold and the love of God is, is barely a flicker in some places, even in our own parishes. And yet, we, and we can probably want to think that, man, this is just probably the worst time to be Catholic. You know, there's so many challenges inside the church and so many challenges outside the church. And the reality is it's not the worst time to be Catholic. Because there's never a bad time to be Catholic. And there's always been, in every generation and every season of the church, uh, a call uh, to all Catholics to step up and heroically go forth and take on this mission of renewing and, and rebuilding the church and making it all that Christ desires. Um, before we jump into uh, too much further, I want to do two things. Number one, I just want to kind of give you a little tutorial on your go-to webinar control panel because we want this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So as you scroll down your, your side of your screen and you see the, the webinar control panel, you'll see a little button, a little arrow pointing to the word question. Uh, and what you can do, and on the other side you'll see like a little square with an arrow sticking out of it. Click on that square with the st arrow sticking out of it and it'll like expand into like a bar across your screen where you can type in questions for Chris or myself at any time during the webinar, any comments that you want to make, any insights that you have, uh, anything that you want us to clarify on, just type it in there. And we'll be glad to answer your questions and respond and we want to make sure that in the midst of all our uh, crazy rambling that we actually say something that you want to hear. So if you have a question, please, by all means, uh, enter uh, at that question right in there. If you have and a compliment, and, all it, cap. Yes. If a critique, yes. put it in six point font. Yes, big, bolded compliments for Chris. <laughs> and uh, try to keep your uh, criticisms of me to a minimum. I'm kind of afraid. <laughs> uh, but before we go any further, I, I just want to ask the Lord to bless our time. So uh, let's just come before the Lord and ask him to pour out grace. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Uh, good and gracious God, we turn to you now uh, during this season of Lent as we continue to prepare our hearts and ask you to rebuild us, that we would be able to uh, you know, celebrate the mission of Franciscan University's Christian Outreach Office and the Steubenville Conferences, but also be able to embrace in a deeper way the mission that you've given each one of us to go rebuild the church, to be that living witness, a living stone in your temple. Help us, O oh Lord, with your grace to have the courage, the wisdom, the strength, and the love necessary to go forth as joyful disciples, bringing your hope, your peace, and your salvation to the world. And we ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen. amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So before I jump into it, Chris, what have you been up to lately? What's, what are you going? What do you got going on, man? Uh, a little too much, kind of juggling on the balls. But you know, I'm trying to stay occupied, not busy. This is, you know, a good priest friend of mine. If I ask him, "You busy? You got a lot going on?" No, no, I'm occupied, and I've taken on that phrase and repeated it to myself regularly. Busy means I'm frazzled, I'm scattered, I'm doing a lot of different things. Occupied means I have one thing I'm doing. One thing only is required. I'm, I'm my eyes are on the Lord, my heart's set on Him, and I'm doing whatever the heck He wants. That could take the form of doing a million different things, but it's only one thing in my heart, and then I don't freak out. So I'm occupied today with putting the final edits on a new TV show we got coming out called Real Life Catholic, which shows the beauty of faith in everyday life. Season 1 is 10 episodes, going everywhere from South Louisiana to Hawaii to Sheboygan to you know all these places around the country showing Catholics living out their faith. 
and how and how amazing that makes daily life. Um, so that's and, and we're shooting to get that on Netflix. So pray that that happens. Nice. Uh, it's looking looking good, you know. But definitely on EWTN and YouTube for sure. Cool, cool. Yeah, you know, a, a good priest friend of mine said, uh, uh, "Busy is an acronym for um, burden under Satan's yoke." Yeah. So you don't want to be busy because when we're busy, you're right. You know, we're being pulled by false yeah. desires, thing, pressures we put on our, ourselves under. Let's, yeah, I like that. Uh, let's be occupied with uh, the will of the Lord and, and the one thing that He's calling us to do in each moment to moment. I like that. Amen. Um, Amen. The main thing, though, Go ahead. that's keeping me. The, the main thing I'm occupied with, with our with our ministry in general, like that, that's this, the TV show is a special project right now. The main thing is these parish renewal events called Reboot Live, uh, where we um, focus on the basic gospel message and inviting people to it. And we're doing that in a different state every week around the country. Um, we work with parishes for six months leading up to the event to train them to invite their whole neighborhood back to church. Because of that process, we're seeing small towns get a thousand people at this event. Um, not from a big region, but their neighbors, their cousins, the people who don't go to church usually. And I, and I tell you, man, that's just, I never get tired of that event. It is, it, we're seeing conversions happen every week. It's so exciting. Just watching the grace of God in action. So that's the main thing. That's the main thing with our ministry. That's cool. That's cool, man. Yeah, you know, we, we talk about uh, being occupied. You know, you, you you know, you and I are both graduates of Franciscan University. You, I, I work for the conferences. I speak at the adult conferences. You're hosting youth conferences, and you've been involved for many years. And, and you've got other ministries and everything. And you know, we we can kind of look at the the mission of what we do here through our conference office, and and really trace it back to first to St. Francis himself, right? He's the patron of Francis University. And when we think about his influence on who we are and our spirituality and what we received here as students at Franciscan and how that has really exploded, not just through our conference outreach, but in alumni like yourself and, and taking up that mantle. You know, it was uh, back in the 1200s when St. Francis uh, was first going through his initial stages of conversion. And he, he had a couple of key moments where, you know, he was growing, growing, and God just kind of gave him that nudge and he just went, further than he than he'd ever had and felt more deeply in love. And on this particular day in his life, he uh, was walking uh, through the streets of the CC and wanted to go into the Church of St. Damien to uh, pray. Uh, just really felt drawn in his spirit to go pray. And as he knelt before the the, 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 the San Damiano cross, he uh, you know he, he asked the Lord to give him you know perfect faith, perfect charity, right wisdom so he could know the Lord's holy will. And he asked for the grace to do that. And in the silence that followed that prayer, the Lord interrupted it by speaking directly into his heart. Francis, go rebuild my house, which is in need of repair. And it was such a such a, a key moment. Like he went into a state of ecstasy after you know after hearing the voice of the Lord and, and contemplating those words as he prayed before the the cross. And so. He, after he uh, came out of his state of ecstasy and ended his prayer, he took the Lord at his word and went down the street and found this little chapel, the Porciunco. Literally. It was yeah. uh, literally the roof was collapsing on the place, and he thought, well, that's what the Lord wants me to do. Go rebuild this little church. Yeah. And yeah. now if you go to Assisi in the middle of the, the downtown area, there's this huge, huge basilica, and in the middle of it is the tiny, tiny chapel. They built this huge, this huge edifice, this huge glorification, and in the middle of it is this humble little chapel covered with painted frescoes, and just it's just an amazing thing to go and see. And that I'm was the that St. Francis built. And of course, what's that? It's just mind blowing. We we, we so yeah. often think. We we think we're we're on the right track, and we are because we, we just do the what's right before us. But we think we we got the whole plan in mind. But right. The strategic plan is to keep your eyes on the Lord. You you're like it's a joke to think like five years ago. There's no way I guess I'd be where I am right now in ministry, doing the things, focusing on the things I am. Yeah. We just keep going. But what was so cool about what Saint Francis did is while he was building this little church. He, uh, he, he needed building supplies, so he went and took a bunch of his dad. His dad was a famous uh, cloth maker. He took a bunch of his dad's cloth, and yeah. he sold it so he could buy building supplies, and his dad was furious with him. 
uh, and dragged him before the local bishop and accused him and said, do something with my renegade son. And in the midst of that, St. Francis had another level of his conversion. He stripped down into his birthday suit and renounced his wealth, announced all claims. You know, he, had, he, had, he was raised in a very extravagant lifestyle of the best of food, drink, parties, clothing, everything. He had uh, dream, childhood dreams of being a chivalrous knight and, and winning wars and being recognized for his bravery and his courage. And then now, now down the road, after he had really started to follow the Lord, all this stuff meant nothing to him. He just kind of really naked into the world he came and, and, and naked up from this world back into living in the kingdom of God. He went. Um, and it, it caused a stir, but it also caused people to take notice. And other guys were coming along and said, hey, you, you're building that church, can I help? And he started forming this community of men and women who were in support of, and of what he was doing. And, and as he was praying and as he was building, he, his heart was drawn deeper into Christ to, uh, to the point where he was finally, I mean, I think this was kind of the turning point. God had, um, you know, he had always had, St. Francis had always had, had always had an aversion to ugliness, especially lepers. Didn't want anything to do with lepers, and in uh, in one particular day, the Lord said, "I want you to go and minister to the lepers." And he, he found a leper on the side of the road and was able to embrace him and kiss him. And he wrote in his personal uh, memoirs afterwards, the thing that was most repugnant to him in the world became the sweetest of things. And when we look at and where I'm going with all this is when we look at the call to go rebuild the church and what we're talking about, you know, in St. Francis's progression, it's like, okay, first I'm going to build a church, then I'm going to try to renew the church, but in the end it's about how can I align myself most with Christ and, and, and become a living stone that God calls me to be first. Beautiful stuff. Hey, man. It's all about, man. When you think about St. Francis and his life and his witness, you know, what, 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 what stirs your heart? His simple focus on the, the gospel message. I mean, it's all he was trying to do was just live it out. He didn't have this complex rule of life drawn up. He wasn't called a Franciscan. He was, <laughs> he was St. Francis. He was the OG Franciscan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. the name came later after him. He was just trying his best to live out the simplicity of the gospel. I yeah. think so often uh, in our own personal lives, in the church, we, we, we get lost in all the implications of the gospel, in, in the life and the beauty and the rituals and all the grandeur and everything that comes from the gospel. And we try to give that to the world. On the flip side, we have a world that gets lost in all the issues. You know, we, try, we come with this whole big picture and the world thinks, you know, the, the Christianity, the gospel, it's about... It's about the church's teaching on, on some political issue, on a particular moral issue. On, you know, it's about this thing, this problematic thing that happened in, in the history of the church. You, what, what do you say about that? You know, but at the heart of all this is something very simple. It's the fact that God's calling us to a relationship with himself. He's given his life to us. He's calling us to give our whole lives unreservedly back to him. That's what Francis embodied in his life. Right. He was living on his baptismal call. That's all he was doing. Right. Um, so it's that simple focus that I struggle for in my daily life and I struggle for in my ministry and that I've made our whole ministry about with, with, our, with the Reboot Live events where, where we're seeing convergence happen. You know, I, I gave an event a couple weeks ago. My cousin came. We've gone to Catholic school for years and years. He got to church. Uh, well, he stopped going for a while. He went he got to sacraments, you know. But he said, Chris, I'd never thought of Catholicism as having anything to do with my relationship with God before tonight. Hmm. What? How are we missing this? Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I think the way we convey it and the world perceives us, it's ballooned out into all this exterior stuff that has come from the heart of the gospel. So I, I see in Francis's life what I'm trying to do in my, my life and, and work, which is return to the heart of it all. Amen. It never gets old. No, it you know, doesn't. And 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 people even there as people look at the, the life of Saint Francis, right? They you know they're they're so quick to say, well, yeah, he was a, a poor beggar. 
you know, he lived in poverty or, or, you know, they look at him or he was, he was a nature boy. You know, he liked to run around with squirrels and other furry creatures and birds like to land on for some reason. He, he attracted birds and other small woodland creatures. And, and, and. With Bob you know, Yeah. Right. Well, he kills them after he attracts them, right? He's a... uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's issues there, yeah. Um, <laughs> but with St. Francis, you know, he, he didn't embrace poverty for poverty's sake. He didn't embrace yeah. poverty because he thought poverty was cool. He embraced Christ, and because of his relationship with Jesus Christ, because of that intimacy, because of that love relationship that, that you're talking about, Chris, the heart of it all was so strong, and because of the heart of Christ beat so deeply in him, he was able to choose poverty out of love for Christ. You know, he Amen. didn't choose love for Christ out of his poverty. And I think, you know, when we are looking at how do we progress spiritually and how can we become people who bring renewal to our families and the people we work with. The first and foremost thing that we need to do is, like you're saying, is get deeper into our own personal life-changing relationship with Christ. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, I, I, when, when you're in a fight, if you, when you go into fight or flight mode, your extremities get kind of cold. Uh, you'll notice this if you have a lot of anxiety. Someone cut you off in the freeway, you think it's about to kill you. Feel your, feel your hands afterwards, feel your fingertips, they get cold. Because the blood just rushes right away from all your extremities to your heart. Mm. So that you can either fight for, for longer or run for longer. But it, it starts to go where it's really needed to keep you alive. You know, you say at the beginning of the webinar, you know, there's a lot of people can look at this time in the church, in the world, and say, what a horrible time to be Catholic. No, I think this is a time where God is calling us back to the heart of it all. Amen. And if we get that right, the church will be renewed and the world will be renewed. Because the gospel message has lost none of its potency. If we don't get that right, we're toast. Yeah. <laughs> but that's exciting, because we're going to get it right. There's no other option. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and, and, and I think of, uh, you know, once again on our conference outreach, you know, in, a, in our day and time, you know, Chris, the, the, the person probably that would say, you know, had such a profound influence on us and our vision of ministry was Father Michael Scanlon, right? Yeah. Um, you talk about a man after God's own heart, a man who in so many ways embodied the spirit of St. Francis. Uh, you know, when, when, when Father Mike uh, had his, his, the renewal of his heart and his mind through a, a, a profound encounter with the person of the Holy Spirit, you know, it wasn't enough for him to go, wow, I can check that off. That, that's a great thing. I'm so happy that I have the Holy Spirit at work in my life. He immediately turned all that God was doing inside of him outwardly and said, I want to bring as many people as I can into this new outpouring of the Spirit so they can have this in a live and deep, rich, life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. And, and, and part of that was... He said, I want, I, want to, I want to get priests on board. You know, this has changed my priesthood. It's changed the way I view myself, my vocation. So he brought a couple hundred priests to Franciscan University one summer, 1975. Father Mike, and they didn't have a schedule for this conference. They didn't know what they were going to do. They would actually get together during dinner, and they would pray with one another, and someone would say, hey, I think the Lord wants me to share that. And they'd all say, yeah, that sounds good, go. And then they would have their evening. And, not, and, and what are you going to speak on? Well, I'm not, I think the Lord is asking me to speak on that. Oh, cool. Go do that. That sounds great. Oh, man, that's cool. And they just <laughs> were docile and, and, and kind of let the Spirit lead every part of it. Yeah. And then uh, at the end of this priest retreat, this priest conference, you know, the priests were like, we need something like this for our young people. And Father Mike, he's like, I'm not a youth minister. I don't know any young people. I work here at the college. I know my college students, but I, I don't know how to get high school students interested in Jesus. I don't know how to get high school students to want to come to something like this. And remember, this was the 70s. You know, catechesis yeah. was insane for a decade and a half. And, oh, yeah. you know, there was just a lot of things that were kind of uh, broken and, and, and a little off in the church. Uh, and yet, all the priests stood up and said, Father Mike, all you have to do is put on the conference. We'll bring the teens. And so Father Mike not knowing really what he was doing, but knowing that the Lord was calling him to do it, said yes. Mm. He said yes. He never mm. said no to the Lord. He said yes once again in faith, said yes. And out of that... How many young people have been to the conferences? 
Well, that, this, yeah. this is the beauty of it. You know, I look at what Father Mike said yes to, you know, to, to take a step in faith. And, and, and this year we're going to put on 25 youth conferences across the United States, coast to coast, and two up in Canada. We're going to serve 60,000 teens and their leaders at our youth conferences. Since Father Mike's initial yes, over a million people have attended the Studentville Conference. Every year, every year, the ordination class out of all the priests that are ordained in the United States, 15% say, I heard the call to the priesthood at a Studentville Conference. You're there's kidding. Guys like you, uh, there's guys like me who are now you know, second generation, you know, you, you know, we, 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 we received so much from being students here at the university, and now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lucky to be back here serving this mission. I spent 15 years doing youth ministry in parishes because I had instilled in me that, you know, I had to take on that mission. And you're, and Chris, you're wow. just, Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Man, mm -hmm. those numbers blow me away. Most of all, the impact blows me away because I know I, those numbers wouldn't blow me away if it made a shallow impact. I know from years of working with the conferences, life yeah. changes these things because yeah. it, it focuses on the core message of the gospel. It focuses on the, you know, um, the answering the great, the greatest question of our era: Why should I even care? Right. <laughs> right. We as a church get too caught up in answering a billion other questions that underlying all those questions is why should I care anyway? So I'm going to throw this, that, and the other thing at you, but really, I'm just asking, why the heck? I, why is this even relevant? Why are you bothering me? Right? Yeah. <laughs> that basic evangelization answers that question. Why should I care? That's what rebuilds the church. And I love the story you were just sharing about how, how Father Michael, you know, how those conferences emerged. I mean, this is, and this is something I saw in his spirit, something I see in Francis' spirit, something I see at the university. And I'm not saying this is a cheesy salesman for the university because I don't work for the university, right? <laughs> I went there um, to be a part of the conferences. On every level at the university, uh, you see people who talk about Jesus as if they personally know him. They don't talk about him uh, like he's a topic, like he's a theory, but a friend, someone they're in an intimate relationship with. That's how evangelization happens. You and me are blessed to do professional evangelization. It happens by presenting it in just the right way to convince people and move hearts. But for the majority of the church, the reason a million people have been to those conferences. It's not, we're not inviting a million people. It's because of people who are out there in the trenches living their Catholic life and actually talking about Jesus like they know him. The early Christians called themselves the living ones. It's people being out in the world as living ones, where people look at, some, at, at their eyes and say, there's something different in you. It's the, it's the friend you're talking about. <laughs> not to sound cheesy, but, you know, it is. It's that, heart, that heartfelt connection totally transforms the church. Yeah. Now, Father Mike, this, the beauty of, of and depth came very much in a very Franciscan way. And, and in this way, I think Father Mike reflected uh, St. Francis so well. You know, his, his entire ministry was built on two words, preach Jesus. And he never went off message. Wow. He never missed an opportunity to tell somebody about what Jesus was doing in his life. He never missed the opportunity to give glory to the name of Jesus in his preaching, whether it be a, a, a noonday mass homily or a, a keynote at a conference or an opportunity just to be talking with students as they're walking to and from class and he'd be walking up the sidewalk. He was always preaching Jesus and, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Franciscan is attributed to St. Francis, although you know, our, 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 our Franciscan scholars question the, the validity. It's still a good proverb uh, for the Franciscans is that you should preach always and if necessary use those words. You know, that, that, that our lives should be preaching the reality that God is alive and that he's madly in love with us. That we yeah. know love, you know, and the way we live, it should be coming out. That's it. Is that is that dripping from your, your personality, from your every word, is it emanating from you? And not in a forced way. It, it, you know, it, if you're living that, if we're not busy but we're occupied, if we're spending time in daily prayer, it's going to naturally come out of us. As long as we get over the hump of our, our self-consciousness. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we want to hold back those, those casual words that just show the world who we are. I mean, we have a world that constantly tells everyone to be who you are, unless you're a Catholic. Right, and we go along with that. I have no idea why we keep going along with that. I was at a campus in Jersey, 
uh, the director of inclusivity and diversity there said 67% of our campus is Catholic. They're all afraid to tell anyone. Mm. What? Yeah. Uh, well, why? I know why. Because it's caught up in all the exterior things. As soon as you say I'm Catholic, they think, oh, I got you pegged on a million different issues. Uh, it, it's us that, that, that turns the ship around, that rebuild the church and says, you don't have me pegged at all. You know, being Catholic means I'm in love. That's what it means. And if you understand that context, you understand the rest. If you don't get that context, the rest is, is, like, is rules, regulations, and rituals that have nothing to do with life. Once you get that context, dude, I'll, I'll accept the rest. I'll accept anything that Jesus says. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, and then I think that's true. You know, when, we, when, when, when Francis came to his United States visit, uh, it was amazing how many people got frustrated with the fact that he didn't come out and say, okay, guys, you know, the church is teaching on, on, on gay marriage or the church is teaching on abortion. Let's remember these teachings. Let's be sure that we know who we are through our theology. Um, he wasn't interested in leading with, uh, you know, dogmatic statements of truth, not because they're not true and not because he doesn't believe them, but because the world that we live in is looking at the church and says, I don't care if you're true unless I know that you're good and beautiful. The three aspects of God, goodness, yeah. beauty, and truth. And yeah. we already live in a relativistic society. It's, Chris, you've spoken more on relativism and, and how it affects young people than most people I know. But we know that if you come up in front of a, a group of young people, probably the first thing that will get them to tune out more than anything is if you start with, and this is what the Catholic Church teaches as the truth. You know, because you little relativist pagans. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But see... Right. They're waiting to see, is the church good? Is the church yeah. beautiful? And that's where we come in. We are the reflective facets of the beauty of God's love when we let it shine forth and we reflect that, that glory to the world. That's our job. Amen. That's our job. The beauty of stained glass is that it doesn't really look all that great unless you're inside the church and the sun's shining through the windows. From the outside, stained glass can look kind of dark. But we're the ones who are supposed to go outside of the church and shine that brightness and say, the church is a beautiful place because Jesus yeah. is there. And I'm a different person because Jesus is here. And come find, come with me and see. I, I found Jesus in this church. Come with me, and I will show you where I find what makes me who I am. And, yes. you know, unless we go forth and become an access come point. And see. Come and see. You know, I, I, and there's, you know, there's times I wish... There would be more clarity from the Pope on different things. However, he has spoken clearly about abortion, about about gender, about marriage. It, he's not getting caught up in like, you know, the world wants us to constantly repeat what we say about that a million times. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the world wants to make that an excuse for not not coming to Jesus, right. not being challenged to live different. And they, they want permission to write us off right there. So, yeah, but I love how Pope Francis lands here and, and the whole country saying, yeah, but what about this, what about this, what about this? And he kind of dodges past it all, and he's, he's trying to say, hey, yeah, yeah, but wait, what about the fact that God's calling you to a relationship with himself? What about that? Mm -hmm. Because that's all that matters in the end, and the rest only makes sense in that context. Like marriage. I often think of my own marriage as, in, in light of evangelization. And vice versa, you know, outside the context of love, all I have is a is a burdensome relationship that takes up my time and mm. gives me rules and limits my freedom. In the context of the love story that I need to stay rooted in, that I need to I go when, for dinner with my wife, just keep myself rooted. It takes discipline to be occupied with that instead of busy mm. with the stuff of marriage. When I get the context, the rest is is um, it's if it's not a joy, it's a light burden. It all mm. makes sense. It's not something I resent. Uh, that's the gospel. That's Christianity. If we get that love relationship, Pope Francis recently said, we're in the midst of a love story. If we don't understand that, we've understood nothing of what the church is. Mm. If we get that, the rest is, is uh, you know, it's easy, to, it's easy to take. It makes sense. The burden's light. I agree. I, I think the reason in the Garden of Eden, even, you could trace the church, you know, the fall of man, um, Satan went into the mind of Adam and Eve and twisted God's words. He didn't go to their hearts. Because in their hearts, if they would have been, if they would have focused on where their hearts were with the Lord and with God's presence in their life, 
there's no way that that Satan could have messed with it. You know, but he he started up here, get, getting them to doubt, and they kept it right here on God's commands, and he twisted it and he twisted it. And this is why loving the Lord from our hearts, not just an assent of saying I agree with the teaching of the church, but do I love the Lord from my heart? Am I willing to lay down my life for this guy? Am I willing to serve this one I call Jesus and, and change the way I see things, change the way I treat other people because they are a reflection of, that, of the one I love? Am I willing to say no to passions because they wound the one I love? Yeah, and had, had Adam and Eve taken it back to, well, it doesn't matter what you say. I know this guy loves me and I trust him. There was no way that Satan could have tricked them into eating the apple. But of course, we're weak and we're probably prone to die. And you know, I'm looking forward to uh, you know the Holy Saturday celebration where we can celebrate the old happy fault that one is such a great savior. But uh, uh, yeah. we only get to pray it once a year, so I love I love praying. Uh, no, no. Yeah, we we're all, it, buddy. We, we probably would have done any better if we'd been in the garden. We would have been like lining up, you know. <laughs> yeah. Make I it consider to live out the most pathetic Lent ever. Yeah. You know, it just all the resolutions to give up things and sacrifice. I don't know how St. Francis did it, boy. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's weak. But, you know, the Lord uh, he consistently leads me through the best Lent ever, too, uh, just by different ways of purifying that I, I didn't see coming. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah I, it, I, but all that's in the context of this is not about my perfect love for him, boy. It, thank God. I'm going to be toast. Mm -hmm. It's about his love for us. Yes. First John 4.19 constantly is a reminder of who we really are. It's we love because he first loved us. And this is not, we didn't initiate this. We didn't make this up. We didn't, we didn't create this idea of God's love. We know it because he's loved us first. You know, we, how could we even comprehend something as beautiful of, of love unless we actually had experiences? And people say uh, it's, it's too good to be true. It's, it's, it, 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 it's too good to be to seem true, but the beauty yeah, of it yeah. is it is true. It, is? it almost seems too good to be true, but it is really. Yeah. It's the stuff of fairy tales. Exactly. Who'd make this up? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the prophets could have tried to imagine it for for a thousand years. They wouldn't have thought up something this good. Mm. I mean, this is what we have to offer the world. This is why people need to be proud to be Catholic again. This is why the church needs to recenter on the gospel again. And instead of being known as, as the church of the issues mm -hmm. and the church of some cause, yes, we have the issues, we have the cause. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean we don't speak about life issues or marriage. We have to show the gospel embraces every facet of the human experience. But first and foremost, we have to be known as the church of the gospel. Amen. Otherwise, we're noisy gongs playing symbols. What the heck are we doing? We're just another political group out there vying for their own interests. That's how the world perceives us. And then they write us off. Right. We have to be the church of the gospel again that has a challenge to give to each individual heart that stands before each heart with Jesus Christ saying, we're calling you to something. We're inviting you to something. The love you're made for. Amen. So, you know, you know when you come to a Steubenville conference, you know, and, and I'm going to kind of shift gears after I make this statement and talk about maybe, Chris, we can maybe encourage some of the people on this webinar. What are some things that we as everyday Catholics, away from, you know, you know, the, the big picture of conferences, but what can everyday Catholics do to rebuild the church? But before I do that, I want to say, like, you know, we have committed ourselves to one thing here in this office, and that's never cut the roots that, that uh, caused us to grow. You know, we will always be an office that prays. You know, we do two or three different retreats a year to discern topics and themes. There are literally thousands of hours being of prayer being put on, on by speakers, and, and our team here in the office, priests that support us, people that are out there in the field, thousands and thousands of hours of prayer and discernment and conversation and listening to the Lord that go into kind of coming up just like, what are we going to do at one conference? Why? Because these are, these are Christ conferences. They're not, they don't belong to me. They don't belong to Francis University. They were, we're stewards of something that's greater than us. And we are blessed to be able to stand on the shoulders of giants like Father Michael Scanlon. And then the second thing is, when you come to a Steubenville conference, you are going to hear the love of Jesus Christ preached with boldness and confidence, because that's where it's at. 
You know, the truth is the truth, but the truth is an extension of the love of Jesus Christ. It's a manifestation of who he is as a person. And until you get to know that heart, that heart that beats for you, that heart that bled for you, the heart that was pierced for you and burns like the, the sacred heart icon, burns with love for you, until you get to know that heart personally, you're not going to have a reg much of a regard for the truth that Jesus speaks. Because that truth is a part of that heart. And people will love the truth after they come to know that the person behind that truth has died for them and has risen from the grave so that they can live without fear and live in confidence of knowing that they are loved by a God who has a perfect plan for their lives. That gives people hope. That gives people joy. And that gives people the courage to live the truth. Not just, okay, I agree with the church, but I'm going to live that truth. Because anyone can say, I, even Satan knows the, the, the scriptures. Even, better you know, than we do. Yeah, better than we do. It's not it's about how much you know, and it's it's about how much you, you're willing to love. There's no so, obedience, there's no love, there's no humility, but he knows it all. Yeah. Amen. And so we got a number of people on this webinar with us. You know, we have all, you know, the thing is, the, the call to build the church is not the... Uh, it's not the exclusive property of a handful of people, you know. I think uh, we're blessed to have uh, many talented people like Chris being raised up by the Lord in this generation to uh, to reach a broad audience. But, you know, there's still no substitute for the one-on-one -on -one interactions that need to take place to engage and accompany people on a spiritual journey that will lead them back to the arms of Jesus Christ. So, Chris, you know, what, what tips, advice, um, kind of encouragement could you give people on this webinar to how can they maybe discover, cultivate, and live out their personal call to go rebuild the church? Stop underestimating how important you are. Stop underestimating the power that God wants to work in the world through you. And, and when people hear those words, the first thought is, well, maybe you think maybe God's calling me to preach the gospel from a stage like you. No, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I think we get it all wrong. We use the world standards to judge effectiveness. Uh, God is calling every single person to be a witness to the gospel um, in those simple ways every day. And, and don't confuse simple with simplistic. Simple is powerful. You know, so you're thinking, well, what can I possibly do? Just say, God bless you, the guy at the grocery store gives me change? Yeah. Do you know how powerful that can be? You know, what can I do? Tell a friend I'm praying for him when he tells me I had a bad day? Yeah, do you have any idea that could change someone's life? You know, a, 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 or a non-believing friend, to invite them to church with you. These things are life-changing. But what if they get angry? Uh, okay, if they get angry, that's their problem, right? I mean, I'm not saying be obnoxious about it. But sometimes we, we I, I'd say most, most often, they're not going to get angry with you. We impose our discomforts with sharing the gospel on other people. You know, if you're going to share about a sport you're passionate about, the person's not passionate about that sport, they'll hear you out, but they're not going to get angry. <laughs> Let it be the same with Jesus. A lot of times they'll respect you. Uh, you know, I, I, uh, this great quote from Penn, you know, Penn and Teller. Penn's an atheist. Uh, he's a famous magician, comedian, atheist. And he said, how much do you have to hate someone to not evangelize them, to believe mm. that eternal life is possible and to not tell them about that? Mm. So a lot of people who don't even believe might respect if we just drop a little line about Jesus here and there. Um, so, you know, and if, even if they get angry, you planted a thought about God in that person's mind, you have no idea the ripple effect of that, where that could end in the eternal perspective. You know, the, the most important people in Scripture are, are the nameless people. The most important part of salvation history, the secret sauce, is the most boring part of the Bible. It's the genealogies. It's that long list of names. You don't recognize any of them. Really, that, that's, that's the billion Catholics in the world. You know, at the end of the day, it's even the people we look up to and think they're a big deal Catholic. Give me a break. You know, I mean, people at a conference, are not, you, they leave the conference, no one down the street knows who the heck they are. You know, there's no real big deals going on here. The big deal is Jesus, all right? And we all have our small part to play, but the small part is a huge, the small part we have to play is a big deal. Don't underestimate the power of just having a conversation like me and John are right now, uh, we can see that John, I love talking, I'm so inspired by it, because you can see it in your face, you talk about the sacred heart of Jesus like he's close to you, like you know him. Uh, that's not something you could hide if you tried to, whether you're talking to a believer or a non-believer. And when you talk about it with sincerity like that, it doesn't turn anybody off, because mm. they know that the place you're coming from is just being real. 
Uh, people respect that. People respect real. I, I couldn't agree more. I think you know we uh, when we when we think about uh, the the work of of renewing the church and rebuilding. You know, I mean, I, what, once again, you know, it is absolutely essential that we as lay people understand. The, the significant, significant role that we have right now, especially when we look at how stretched strength in our priesthood is. You know, this idea that, oh, it's the priest's job, you know, or, that's, it's some, or we have a youth minister, or we have people who, uh, you know, do adult faith formation in our parish. They're the ones that are in charge of, you know, making sure people get right. evangelized. Yeah. You know, we, 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 we have a tendency to, okay, I write my check, I throw it in the collection pot, I, go, I mean, I'm going to church on Sunday, what more is there? There is there's a, an exciting life that God is calling each of us to, and I agree, Chris. I think we have to understand that not only does God call us to greatness, He expects greatness, not for the sake of our own "I'm great, look at me," but because we are made in His image and likeness. If you don't believe that, look what look just look at the power that He's given simple men and women to help create new life. Let that be a template of saying. What kind of power has God given man? That is a, a physical uh, manifestation of a spiritual reality. We can all produce spiritually children in faith through our sharing of love. When you share love with a spouse in a particular intimate way, new life comes forth. When we share Jesus with anybody in a particular and intimate way, we can bring a new life back to Christ. We can help awaken you will raise people from the from being dead in their faith to life. You will cause those who can't see God to see God. And Jesus said, what I'm doing, I'm going to send forth, and you're going to do the same. And it says in Romans chapter 5 that every part of our life is to be patterned on the example of Christ, conformed to the image of Christ. And Christ was one who revealed God's love. If every part of our life is to be conformed to Christ, then every part of our life should in some way reveal God's love. That's our call. That's our birthright. That's our destiny. And so, you know, I agree with Chris. Don't sell yourself short. Don't put yourself down. Don't say, well, obviously God's not looking in my way when he says we all have this universal call to evangelize. It absolutely is. It is you. And it's you in a very particular way, in a way that no one else can, because you are a unique manifestation of the love of God. And you can yeah. show God's love in a way that no one else can. Even because of maybe some of the brokenness you carry with you, you, you reveal God in a particular way. And, and, and we, we, we need to be willing to do that. You know, I was uh, traveling with my wife this past August down to uh, North Carolina, and I spent a week on the beach. And we stopped in uh, uh, Beckley, West Virginia, to spend the night halfway there. And in the morning, we got up thinking there was a complimentary breakfast uh, somewhere in the hotel, and there wasn't. So we were very disappointed, but there was a coffee station, and, you know, sometimes coffee is all you need. And I'm walking towards, you know, I shouldn't say walking, I'm more like shuffling towards the coffee station, like, I need coffee. And there was a woman there who was very, she seemed very distracted as she kind of cleaned up and put trash in the can and put out fresh cups and made sure that everything was wiped down. And... Um, as I uh, approached her, I, I looked at her and I could tell that she'd been crying. And immediately, it was like it just fell upon my heart. Just say something nice to her. Just offer her some comfort. And I said, and I just turned around and said, hey, good morning. Thank you for being out here and making sure there's coffee. I don't know if I'd be able to make it all the way to North Carolina without some, some good coffee. And, and she said, oh, it's, it's no problem. And, you know, the fact that she responded, she was very pleasant. But I, then I just said, is everything all right? You just you just look a little sad this morning. Well, she went on to explain to me how her sister had just been diagnosed with a brain aneurysm and that she was could be you know very close to death and that uh, you know she had she couldn't get off work to go down and see her. It was just she was just very broken. And at the end of her telling me her story, I you know I just once again said, I'm so sorry for what you're in. Can I can I pray with you right now? And she said, Absolutely. So I, I just put my hand on her shoulder and just said, Jesus, just come with your spirit right now. I asked her her name was Teresa. I said, come with Teresa right now. Just come with your spirit and fall on her and let her know that she's loved. And we, we looked up her sister who's in the hospital. And Lord, I pray that, uh, you know, you're able to open a door so that she can go see her sister. And I mean, I knew this woman who was working, you know, probably 
not not much better than minimum wage doing housekeeping at a hotel. So I, I gave her forty dollars and I said, I hope this helps with gas money so you can make it down to Charleston and see your sister. Wow. Wow. And I don't know what happened. It doesn't matter. Didn't did she you know, I, I, she started crying and she gave me a big hug at the end, so I know that God moved. Because she, she responded in a way that said God just did something amazing in her heart, brought her peace, brought her joy, brought her something. God did something. And, and so she gave me the hug, and, 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 I, you know, and I walked away and said, I don't know. I didn't, wasn't there to preach the gospel. I was there to show her Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. That's perfect. You know, That's perfect. And, you know, and, that was, and, and like what Chris is saying, like you're, God will open up doors. If you ask him, God, give me an opportunity today to show your love to somebody. You pray that prayer, Amen. God's not going to not answer that prayer every day. I know it. And you know what else you can't underestimate? Even if you don't have these measurable things like that at the end of the day, uh, my own conversion. Uh, my parents dragged me to a youth conference I didn't want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> right? I'm one of them. And what changed my life, I, I walked into the room. It was, it, the speaker's great, the music was great, but I looked around. Early Christians call themselves the living ones, right? I realized instantly, I'm dead. They're alive. I want to be alive. Uh, just seeing those people change my life. Mm -hmm. If all we can measure at the end of the day or at the end of a lifetime is that I was one of the living ones, we've been part of the message that the whole body of Christ is supposed to be screaming to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've been part of making the gospel alive in 2017, attractive and beautiful. And never under, underestimate the power of that. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a beautiful thing, you know. And I, and I know that, um, you know, St. Teresa of Avila had to pray, you know, Christ has no body now but yours. You know, he has no hands but mine. He has no feet with which to walk to go preach the good news. He has no voice except for mine. And, and Jesus is longing. You know, people say, well, why doesn't Jesus speak to people? Why doesn't he make himself more present? And I'm like saying, he does, but you, you, you're holding back his voice by not opening your mouth. Amen. And, you know, we're, we are to be that, to speak those words of love. You know, uh, and, 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 and we live in such a broken time. And we have people who are, you know, mocking Christianity in the streets of our country. Uh, mocking the Catholic faith. You know, the last acceptable prejudice in the United States that you can have, and no one's going to get upset with you, is if you're an anti-Catholic. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mock, you can For mock sure. the priest all day long. And so I think we get very angry and very defensive. And, and, but we try, to, we try to throw out statements like, well, hate the sin but love the sinner. And I'm just like, why don't we just love the sinner? Let's not worry about hating sin. It takes too much time, too much energy. You know, if we want to hate sin... Hate the sin in your own life. You know, get rid of your own sin and, and, be, and, and go to war with your own sin. But don't go to war with the sin in others. You know, I'm not saying oh, in political yeah. and social, stand up for what you want when you vote. Do, do all your civic duties. But when you encounter people, don't look to love to hate their sin and love the sinner. Just, just love the sinner. You know, that's, that's the command. Love one another. So, you know, let, let's spend our time doing whatever we can to love those people that we want to know Christ and 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 because faith is caught it's a contagious yes. disease that we need to be more symptomatic <laughs> yeah. yes amen to that amen brother yeah well I gotta get back to TV show edits alrighty well Chris is you know uh, before you, you uh, jump off Chris and, and I thank you because I think when we first talked you said you give me 15 maybe 20 minutes and you've been on here for 50 minutes you're very generous your time I know, I know how occupied you are <laughs> uh, but before you step off number one does anyone have a particular question for Chris that you want to type in before he goes any questions whatsoever that's me, folks. Oh, I just lost the question screen. Where is it? Where did it go? You'll have to read the question to me. I don't see the question screen. Oh, there yeah, it is. I've got it in front of me. There aren't any questions yet, but I'm going to do a going once, going twice, going three times. Any questions for Chris before he signs off? Uh, that's all right. Well, Chris, tell people uh, who are on the webinar where they can find out more about your ministry, what you have going on, and maybe even 
find a way of connecting with uh, some of your video content because uh, I, you, you pop up in my Facebook feed all the time and I'm always blessed by what I see and hear uh, you share and they're always so well made. The production that you put into your videos is top notch. The message is spot on. How can more people discover uh, what you're doing out there? Very simple. Go to reallifecatholic.com, sign up for the newsletter. That's it. Uh, we send it out once a month. But don't bog your inbox down. Keep it info confidential and just get all our free videos, everything to share. We have, we have the Facebook feeds, all that stuff, but the, the sure way to get it is, is that. Um, and then the live events. Uh, on the See Chris Live tab on reallifecatholic.com, I'd love to partner with, with people who have a heart for evangelization. Usually it's a, it's a involved, engaged layman at a parish that starts the invite to a parish. And like I said, small towns. I mean, I, our first Reboot Live renewal event was Linton, North Dakota, a town with a thousand residents, 900 people attended. Wow. You know, it's, it's all about the grassroots effort to invite everybody back to the Lord. Uh, so it's, it's a smaller scale of the Billy Graham Crusades going on, but it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing in power. So honored to be with you guys. Uh, Always great. blessed by having a job. Thank you, man. I love you, man. Thank you for all you're doing to serve the church. Thank you for being such a good brother in Christ. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, I'll be praying for you as you continue to work on this next video series, and uh, call me if you need anything, right? Thanks so much, man. Love you. All right. Um, and for everyone else out there, I just want to say, uh, you know, thank you for being a part of this. You know, one of the things that we want to be able to do through the Subo conferences is allow as many people as possible to share our mission. And so we actually developed a program uh, two years ago called Share Our Mission, where we invite people who are out there who are planning on coming to a Subo conference um, to bring people with them. Why? Because it's the simplest way to help other people have an encounter. You can evangelize without ever having to stand up and preach. You know, by going and finding people you know that you want to see their life renewed and touched by God and inviting them to come to one of our five adult conferences. We have the Power and Purpose Conference for those who want more life in the Holy Spirit and understand that in a deeper way. We have our Priest Deacon Seminarians Retreat. So if you know a priest whose ministry uh, can use a renewal or he just can use an annual retreat, this is an excellent opportunity for him to gather with uh, 150 to 200 other priests, deacons, and seminarians from across the United States. It's a beautiful time of prayer. You could gift that to your priest as a, as a thank you. Uh, get them here and maybe pair, pair up with a couple other families to make that happen for them. We have our St. John Bosco Conference for those who are involved in the religious education and the passing on of faith. That includes uh, an RCIA track, a youth ministers track, a faith formation coordinators track, all the different areas of ministry that's about passing on the faith. You come and you get a fellowship, uh, instruction, and there's certification tracks for each one of those different areas of expertise that you might have. Uh, then we have the Applied Biblical Studies uh, Conference, which is uh, sponsored in part by the uh, St. Paul Center for Biblical Studies, who are our next door neighbors under the direction of Dr. Scott Hahn. And it's just cracks open the scriptures and makes them come alive uh, in a, such a vibrant, and dynamic way. So if you have a hunger for a deeper knowledge of scripture, you might want to check out that conference. And finally, we have the Defending the Faith Conference. And the Defending the Faith Conference gathers some of the best minds and some of the best hearts uh, of people who know and love the truth and have a gift for communicating it and helping it become accessible to everyday Catholics who don't have theology degrees. You know, like some of these guys have more letters after their name than, than some people have letters in their name. But uh, they bring not just a, a level of education and expertise, but a level of love for what they teach that's inspiring and blessed. So all of these conferences, you can find out more about them at studentvilleconferences.com. And uh, if you are planning on coming and you want to learn more about the Share Our Mission program or how you might be able to become an ambassador, because we have some excellent tools to help you if you want to become one. And not only that, we have some outstanding rewards, both financial and some other incentives that we put together to say, hey, look, if you want to share our mission, we want to uh, reward you, uh, you know, uh, with a, a discount. So here's, here's an example. If you come into a Studentville conference and you decide to bring somebody who's never been before, we'll do first thing we'll do is we'll take twenty dollars off the cost of your Studentville conference, and we'll take twenty dollars off the person that you're bringing for the first time. So there's no limit to that. So if you wanted to bring a group of ten people to the Studentville conference who've never been before, and you organize it and put it all together, we'll give everyone in your group twenty dollars off each. 
and we'll give you two hundred dollars. It's that simple. You know, it's it's not a commission. It's not a sale. It is simply our way of saying, look, if you're willing to put forth the effort of bringing people to the Lord, we want to help you get here as well and say thank you for your deciding to share our mission. Because here's the thing, you know, the personal invite that you can give another person and bringing them into a deeper encounter with Christ at a studio conference is more powerful than any marketing that I could do. And uh, we would rather invest in you because what we've seen and the beauty of this is these people come as groups to a conference, they have these amazing experiences, and they go back and they have like a nucleus of community uh, that love and they pray together and they have this shared faith experience that's just causing renewal on their broader parishes. There, there was a group of 50 that came from Virginia together on a bus, and this past fall they hosted a huge tent revival and invited 500 people to come in and hear an evening of prayer and preaching and inviting people to experience a deeper outpouring of Christ's love. And these are the kind of things that are happening. Like, it's not just about, oh, I come and I have a great week and then I buy a t-shirt and a couple of books and it's wonderful. It's about, I come, I get set on fire for the Lord, I go back and I'm spreading fire. I'm becoming the, uh, the parish arsonist. Everywhere I go, I'm trying to light fires of faith, you know, which is not a bad thing when it comes to faith. You know, real fire comes from us. Don't think of that. Um, but uh, we would love to be able to uh, to work with you, equip you, and strengthen you to do that work. So if you uh, are interested, uh, what I would recommend you do is after the webinar is over, um, your confirmation email for this webinar had my email address, jbolu at franciscan.edu embedded in it. Just fire me off an email saying, hey, I'd like to learn more about how to be an ambassador, or I'd like to learn more about the conferences, or if there's anything else that you have uh, questions on that you think our office could help you with. Now, we are here to serve the church. We are here to serve you. And if you have the desire to bring renewal to your parish and to expand God's working in the lives of people on your parish, we want to help you any way we can. Why? Because that's our mission. We want to go renew and rebuild the church through the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ. And God wants to use you the same way that he used St. Francis, the same way he used Father Mike, the same way he's using Christopher Hennig. God wants to use you. Your circle of influence might be a lot smaller, but it'll have a deeper impact. And that's what we really think is, is so important, is if, if everyone just did one little section of their world and impacted it deeply, the whole world would get impacted. And then Chris can't go to every parish and preach the gospel, but you can go to a lot of people within your own parish and do that for them in a very powerful and personal way. So I want to encourage you, don't give up hope. Don't sell yourself short. Trust in the Lord. Be a great, strong heart, strong mind. Be courageous. And take what God has poured into your heart, his love, and let that overflow to the world around you. In that way, you will rebuild the church. In that way, you will be an influence. You will help people get closer to Christ. When you stand in heaven, there will be people standing behind you saying, you led me to Jesus, and ultimately I made it here because of your witness. And what Paul says is those will be like jewels in our crowns when we're, when we're in heaven. But in order to do that, we need to put the work and sacrifice in here on earth and take the risk of sharing Christ, even if we might be rejected. Love takes risks, always. Love is always a risk. So take the risks that are good. Take the risks that are necessary in order to make Christ known. And thank you uh, for being a part of this uh, webinar. Really, it's uh, a blessing for us to be able to encourage you. It's a blessing for us to be able to share. I really appreciate Chris coming on board. It was awesome. And just let, be assured that we're going to be praying for you as you continue on your Lenten journey. And I hope we can pray that you have a gloriously joyful and exciting Easter season. So let's close in a prayer, and then uh, we'll say good night. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Uh, Christ, you chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in your sight. You called us by name, and you made us your children. And now you send us forth to be ambassadors of your love, to be those who would be uh, the guide, the friend, the person who would not be afraid to share that love of Jesus with others so that your name can be glorified and your kingdom can be built and we can bring the saving knowledge of Christ's love to, to all people. Pour your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we would have the courage, the wisdom, the love, and everything else that we need to go forth as joyful missionaries ready to bring the gospel to everyone that uh, asks of us and to share the love of Christ with everyone that we meet. And Blessed Mother, you are the perfect disciple. You followed Jesus, and you have been appearing across the world uh, for the last 2,000 years, reminding us of what Jesus said. 
and bringing people to deep, deeper faith. You continue to evangelize in your son's name. In the same way, we, may we appear with love and grace to uh, evangelize others. We ask for your intercession, Mary, as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Have a blessed evening and a joyful Easter.